Welcome to this Killick Explains video and welcome to another topical one. I want to return to the thorny issue of inflation. Who's it good for? Who's it bad for? And I just want to discount one or two of the views you might occasionally see in the media on this. Uh, because inflation has only recently made a fairly strong comeback and people are speculating about whether this is transitory or whether it's more permanent, if you like, um, a lot of the headlines around it are sort of negative. And that's inevitably because we haven't seen much in the way of inflation over the last decade or more. So when we see more of something there hasn't been a lot of, generally people tend to panic. But is that, in fact, the right thing to do? And I'm going to suggest not. So as usual, some extra sources of information coming up. But first of all, a poll result. The question I asked was very simple in a poll on Twitter and LinkedIn, and that was, who is inflation good for? All right, let's, let's look on the, the positive side of life. And I offered the answer, savers. 13% of people who responded said, yes, that's the best of the four answers. Bearing in mind, you can only pick one in my polls. Uh, then I offered spenders. That only got 7%. I'm going to go through these in just a moment in a bit more detail. Then I offered investors. And I'm glad to say that nearly half the people who responded, 47%, said, yeah, actually, inflation can be good for investors. And I'm glad about that because that is often the case. And then finally, I offered borrowers. And about a third of the people who responded said inflation can be good for borrowers. And I have some sympathy with that view, albeit there's a caveat coming up. So let's just go through these answers sort of one in turn before I close out with some points specifically um, aimed at investors in particular. So turning to savers, um, is inflation good or bad? Well, on the one hand, you could say it's good in the sense that if you're receiving, for example, a pension that's linked in some way to inflation, the RPI, and that RPI rate is hovering at 6 or 7%, then in theory that income goes up by 6 or 7%. That's good. Um, but, and there is a big but, if your source of income is interest from a bank account, you might think, well, that's good, Tim, because I can see interest rates rising. But here's the catch, and I cover this idea of real yields in other videos, so I won't labour it. What matters is not so much the headline rate you're earning on those savings, it's the real rate. In other words, take the headline rate your bank's offering, deduct inflation of up to 5, 6 or 7%, and I suspect in a lot of cases on bank deposits, people are in negative territory, which to translate it means they're getting poorer despite the fact they're holding money at the bank. So be careful. It's a mixed picture for savers, I would say. Now, spenders. Um, good or bad? Well, it depends. If you are a big spender, you might say, well, it's great because I should spend money now knowing that things will be more expensive in the future because inflation is going to bring the price of the things I want to buy up. So let's spend now. Yes and no. Okay, number one, I, I wouldn't encourage anyone, uh, that's, that's the way I am, who's running a, a budget on a regular basis to just start spending for the sake of it. Um, and secondly, it does ignore productivity gains. So anyone who buys, which I think is most of us probably are upgrades their phone on a regular basis, will know that there are constant new versions being launched, some more expensive than the last one, some cheaper than the last one. Anyone who's into gaming will know that. New games, some cheaper, some more expensive. Um, but the point being, some of the things that you might think you want to buy now won't be the same things you want to buy in 12 months or 24 months. So it might be better to wait, because you might get a better version of it. And in some cases, you'll get a better version for less. Now, what about um, borrowers? Let's take them next. Now, I know in my poll, uh, they came in sort of fourth position. Let's do borrowers next. Again, a mixed picture, actually. So the problem for borrowers is that as inflation starts to rise, interest costs will start to rise on debt, whether that's mortgages, where the interest rate tends to be relatively low because the loan is secured, whether it's personal loans, which have a more aggressive rate on them, or whether it's you know PCB plans for cars, bank overdrafts. That's the bad news. Inflation is going to tend to pull up the cost of servicing debt. But on the flip side, and governments who've borrowed a lot during the pandemic know this full well, what inflation does is it erodes the real value of debt. The rule of 72 works to help you work out the effect of this, if you like. If inflation is running at, say, 7%, and in the US it is running at around that as I make this video in January 2022, then one way of looking at it, the rule of 72 suggests that in around a decade's time, the real cost of a loan will be 
substantially less, around half what it was 10 years earlier. So people who lived through the 1970s with a mortgage will remember that, my parents did. The cost of clearing the loan had shrunk hugely during that period of high inflation and high oil prices, but it only works if you can afford to carry the interest cost associated with that debt in the meantime. So you need to stay in work, amongst other things, I would suggest. And now we turn to investors. Now you'll see quite a few headlines saying, well, share prices have done well during a period of low inflation, so surely it's inevitable, yin and yang, that as inflation rises, investors will lose out. Actually, not necessarily the case. If you look back over the last, say, 50 or 60 years, um, yes, sudden inflation spikes, sudden shocks, anything that's a shock will tend to hit equity markets and sometimes quite hard. But that's always been true. In the short term, yeah, equity markets have taken a beating sometimes when inflation suddenly spikes. But if what we're seeing is inflation rising and then possibly stabilising and even perhaps floating away, and I don't have a crystal ball on this, but if we're seeing the, the transitory arguments, inflation will, will spike and then perhaps you know, peak, if you like, um, historically when that's happened, equity markets have not only not suffered, they've actually put in some quite decent performances. Yes, investors need to be a bit, little bit more selective, arguably, but there's no reason necessarily to panic about inflation as an equity investor. You do need to be selective. You do need to recognise that relative pricing power matters. Some companies are capable of maintaining growth, others are not. Bargains may emerge, but you need to be wary, therefore, of rapid rotation. Moving suddenly, knee-jerk out of, say, growth stocks into, say, value stocks or vice versa. So, Overall lessons for investors, yes, inflation is at a high level by recent historical terms, but don't necessarily extrapolate that into a massive inflation spike. Secondly, knee-jerk reactions are unwise. In other words, if you've got a well-diversified growth portfolio of equities, for example, don't panic and think, should I be piling into some other part of the market in the short term? That's never a good thing to do, and it's certainly not something to do simply because inflation's reared its ugly head. In fact, look out for the opportunity to add to positions where shares get an, un, you know, an unfair beating, if you like, because people are panicking about an inflation. And thirdly, do diversify. And do revisit your expectations about future growth. Make sure you are looking at real growth rates. Make sure you are being realistic. I mean, over the last five to seven years, the American stock market has turned in some pretty impressive growth numbers. Those were never likely to continue, uh, certainly not indefinitely, but even into the medium term. So be realistic, diversify, but don't wholesale. Shift the balance of your investment strategy simply on the back of media headlines. Now, if you'd like to know more, there's lots and lots I've just discussed there. Please do access our comprehensive video library, killick.com forward slash learn. There are guides available with these bright colours, or at least this one's got a bright colour. There's another one which isn't here on how to invest in equities. Ping me an email, editor at killick.com. And if you'd like um, a sort of more in-depth thought leadership style discussion of some of the issues around portfolio management I've mentioned, then our quarterly flagship magazine, Confidant, it's not a bad place to go hunting. And there's other stuff in there as well. As you can imagine, it's 24 pages. Ping me an email, editor at killick.com and I'll be more than happy to organise that for you.